get thee to a disco by the Smile Syndicate right here on the Smile Syndicate Music Hour. That's a fantastic song. That'll really get you dancing. Well, I need it to because the dreaded mid-show doldrums was threatening to kick in with me, Miss <laughs> Elizabeth. I was half thinking of wandering mm. away from this whole scene. I feel like this but, show is, is really doing well. And, well, and also... Uh, it's about to get even better. Well, I know because I'm going to tell a story and that always goes well when I do. Yeah, something interesting happened to you. Well, yes, it all, something mm -hmm. always does. I have a secret, but I'll tell you later. <sighs> what? I, I, oh. I know what happened to you, I, but go ahead. Let's hear so, it. So you, you've called it out that you're going to grab the wheel and yank us into the ditch. That's fine. Yeah. We'll deal with it when that comes. So you can probably remember some months back, Miss Elizabeth, I was telling you all about how I was trying to hack my life and express myself through the written word. Mm -hmm. And I did that by going to a local competition to write a novel within 48 hours. Yes, there was a bookstore. What a was book it called? A bookstore by hook or by book. By hook or by it book. It appeared overnight. There was a mysterious owner who was, he was a weirdo, quite, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. And he, 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 we, we, we... You had some harebrained <laughs> ideas of your own, I seem to recall. <laughs> harebrained? Yeah. Oh, fiddlesticks to that. It, it was a great idea. I went in there. I took it seriously. I competed with some of my fellow Smileton citizens to, to write the great great novel in 48 mm -hmm. hours i tried to do book eight of a 15 book mm -hmm. fantasy series it was and, quite a feat and who won that uh, it was undecided there was no winner it was a lightning storm zapped all the laptops i had a good laugh at everyone else's expense and they came at me and grabbed my typewriter <laughs> threw it out the window so it was a uh, tko it was a fantastic show for everyone except maybe for you was yeah. not as much fun no well it was no but i did learn something so i what did come out of that was something shocking, though. I told you all about Lillian, that yoga student who beats me up all the time. Mm -hmm. She, her book about it, it, just that sci-fi novel about robots having sex, and that's it. <laughs> it that got published. Of course, it did. Huge bestseller, and yeah. she just sold the movie rights. Yeah, because the robots are like they're like they, they're Android. No, they're not Android. It's a weird <laughs> book. They're like boxes with like the asymmetrical boxes with appendages and stuff. It makes no sense to okay. me at all. But the, the movie people loved it. It's going to be a movie. So yeah. what does that mean? They they announced another competition and Smileton has lost their collective minds. I, I was going to go and participate again. Was, mm -hmm. I've, I've done this once before. I'm going to try to do a better job this time. And I start approaching the bookstore and it's a zoo. It's pandemonium. Mm -hmm. People are frantically charging to get to the yeah. store. It, it, it was a it was a scene and i'm trying to do it the right way i've got my typewriter i got my five thousand sheets of paper i got my huge hat i got my oversized neck pillow i got my coffee i got my hula hoop <laughs> i'm kitted out what? for a proper two days of writing this is not what you need to write a book oh, oh spare me that miss mm. elizabeth you're backseat driving i can tell you all of those things were necessary to write a book so i'm I'm trying to ignore the madness. People are clawing at each other. There's only 25 spots. That's why there's the panic. Right. I, I get closer to the store. And you know those... those and this is a store that, that sort of disappeared. I, yeah. It's and here like, now. We better move re fast. It could disappear overnight again. It's like it reappears for these writing competitions yeah. and then goes somewhere else. It's bizarre. So... Yeah. You know those e-pogo sticks? They're always lying around town. They yeah. started showing up last summer. They're a public health menace. People are cracking their skulls or falling over, mm -hmm. tripping over the things. They're e-pogo sticks. E-pogo sticks. You have so, to put, put a credit card in it, and then they go like, they go really well. It's a nightmare. It's a it's a town-wide <laughs> nightmare. So I'm, I'm, I'm walking and I'm scrambling, but I'm carrying a typewriter, all my stuff. It's heavy. And then I hear this, this bouncing sound behind mm -hmm. me. And it, and all of a sudden I, I'm, I'm flying, I'm flying through the air. What was that, Miss Elizabeth? Well, I think that's somebody's in the background with a, an e -po that's well, what the e pogo. I'm about to like. tell you a tale of suffering, so I'm glad you think that's funny. <laughs> I get knocked over. Somebody came up behind me, and I hear on your left, uh -huh. and I misheard. Sounds like they were polite. So I move to the left. <laughs> yeah. Whammo. My typewriter goes flying and lands in the mud and all uh -huh. my stuff's everywhere. The hula hoop gets bent. The the, the hat goes flying. <laughs> what do you need a hula thank, hoop for? Thank oh. Thank God for the neck pillow, the oversized neck pillow. I would have been in serious landing. trouble. Yeah. So I, I get up and, and, and there's a woman there and she has a knapsack too. And she's like, oh, are you all right? I, mm -hmm. I I said on your left. Didn't you hear me say on your left? So she's giving me attitude already. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you, you, you're you're a crazy person this on this is, pogo this is stick. This a fellow potential yeah. competitor. Well, she has a knapsack and she starts going into it to check if everything's okay. And I see she has an electric typewriter mm -hmm. and, and a cord and some paper in there. And an e-pogo stick. And, yeah. Oh yeah, I haven't forgotten about the e pogos. Thing. Yeah. So so I go, well, are you going to the contest too? And she goes, Oh yeah, I love these things. I go to as many as I can. This will probably be my twentieth one by now. And I'm like, Whoa. 
I got you dead to rights. She's one of these one of these car one of these pool shark author types mm -hmm. bouncing into the small towns thinking she can write circles around the rubes. Uh-huh. So it's 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 the attitude, Miss Elizabeth, that yeah. put me off. I've heard the story before from another perspective, and I think I know who you might be talking what? about. And I think if you would like, we I actually have her on the phone right what? now. Would what? you like to say hello to Vesper Stamper? I, and well, I maybe would. she can um she can give you her perspective on what happened okay, with the this, e pogo stick and your and your big well, cup of coffee and hula hoop. Yeah, because this is weird, because this isn't a live show. So either the studio is bugged and she can hear us, <laughs> or there's some duplicitous uh, malfeasance going on here behind the scenes between you two. Either way, let's go. Hi Vesper, it's really good to see you. Welcome to the show. Hi, Miss Elizabeth. It's good to be here. It's yep. nice to see you. Hi. Oh my it's nice to see you yes. again, Jason. <laughs> Oh, well, thanks. It is great to see you without a pogo stick anywhere near you, because quite frankly, you tend to be kind of a menace, it seems like, when you're on that thing. But do you have any bumps and bruises? Are you okay? Have you cleaned yourself oh, up? I, I I survived, and it, it, it's just one more thing that gets in my way, but I'm not going to let that stop me. I know you took off pretty quick after that. Well, you know, I have, you know, places to go, people to see, and books to write. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, so you're writing a book in yeah. uh, in the bookstore. Were you doing anything else there? Or were you like you, you had a bunch of other things with you that sort of all went flying and you, you sort of had a crowd of people with you. What else happened? I was there to do a book signing. So, you know, I, you know, in addition to writing the next great American novel, you know, I, I had to sign the, the copies of the one that's already out, you know. Oh, see, I knew it. Yes, that's what I was trying to get to. So it was a it was a actually, ringer. It was She's actually, a ringer. It's actually a book signing. You ran oh, wow. into an actual professional author. <laughs> and uh, so, Vesper, you have a book out. I was wondering uh, if you would like to answer a few questions uh, for our listeners about uh, how you became an author and maybe some things about, about the book itself. Oh, sure. I'd love to. So how did you become an author? I was an illustrator first, never thought that I would ever be an author, at least of novels or fiction or anything like that. I thought maybe picture books would be something I could write, but I never thought of myself as a, as a writer or a novelist. And it kind of fell upon me because I, I found a topic I was interested in and uh, uh, just started writing and couldn't stop. So uh, tell us about this book. Give us just some details so that people know sort of what to expect in this novel and what we're talking about. Sure. So the novel is called A Cloud of Outrageous Blue, and it's a young adult historical fiction novel about the Great Plague of 1348. So um, I know that there's some things happening in the world, maybe here, maybe it's reached Smileton as well. Um, maybe some... <laughs> we don't look at the outside news. Maybe some maybe some health events like a global pandemic <laughs> Is that reached here at all. No, no, doesn't ring a bell. Oh, OK, that's good. <laughs> good, good. Well, um, that explains why there could be such a nice crowd at the bookstore. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> it felt like time's gone by. Um, so, yeah, so this is a, a book about the Great Plague of 1348 and a girl who's discovering her creativity at, uh, as that's barreling across medieval England. So before we go too much into the details of the of the novel itself, uh, I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about uh, what young adult fiction means, because I've kind of heard that it's not necessarily just bound up in, you know, one particular age group. Um, but I was wondering from your point of view, what does young adult mean? Yeah, that's so that's such an interesting question because it is fairly vague, right? So we think of young adult novels as things like The Hunger Games, Twilight, um, even, you know, teen romances, things like that. But the fact is that middle schoolers read young adult, you know, early teens, even sometimes younger, and then regular adult adults read it too. But I think that one of the things that... Uh, makes it young adult are these coming of age stories the you know a lot of self-discovery and you know burgeoning adulthood and um you know deciding what kind of person you're going to be when you're writing a book like that is it do you do that sort of young adult orientation up front when you're thinking about the subject matter and then you just write it like a book after that or is it more have you do you ever face a decision where 
I'm writing in a young adult genre, therefore I can't really go in this direction or this isn't, this wouldn't work. It's a little bit dependent on the fact that I'm with a publisher, I'm with Knopf Books for Young Readers. And so that is a children's imprint and they do, you know, everything from babies, board books, all the way up to young adult fiction. And so I'm, I'm somewhat bound by that. I mean, I imagine that if I wanted to write an adult novel, I could do that, but I'm pretty happy with this genre right now. It seems to be, um, it seems to be finding an audience and it seems to be a good way to tell stories about history uh, in a way that's not as boring as a history class, frankly. Mm -hmm. In terms of the main character and the focus of, of this novel, um, Edith is the main character. Um, she's the one who's um, going through the, the events uh, of 1348. And I was wondering if you could um, let us know what uh, if there were any real historical sites or events or um, known like things that happened, you know, or characters from from history that inspired your story. Yeah, um, the the places in A Cloud of Outrageous Blue, like the place names, the towns, they're all fictional names, but they're all based on kind of a an amalgam of different places and different. Um, historical sites or monasteries and things like that. Uh, and I did visit several that I kind of pieced together to to create the story that I was telling. But all of the, let's say all of the historical events in the book are are actual. And the way that the disease unfolded, that's, you know, that's accurate, as well as uh, some of the response, some of the social responses to the pandemic as well. When you're researching in that area, that's obviously like a field that people spend their whole careers right. re working in. Do you, how do you, how do you know when to stop digging into things? Is it, do you have something you need when you're writing and you're trying to put it in as background so you feel like you're on solid ground or do you just kind of do an open net approach and just stop when you feel like you have enough? There's there's a little bit of, well, there's quite a bit of world building that you do at the front end of things so that you have a pretty accurate understanding of, you know, how people lived at the time, what they ate, where the average person, what kind of house they lived in, that kind of thing. And when you're writing about peasants, it's a little bit different than writing about kings and lords and knights, you know. Um, so there's a lot of research that goes into that up front, but then there are going to come up these particular needs you know for instance i have a scene where edith is traveling hundreds of miles and would she have gone on foot would she have gone on horseback no she was too poor to do that would she have gone in a cart and so i found myself researching you know 14th century suspension systems and you know whether people actually traveled in groups by cart and the fact the 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 conclusion is that it was inconclusive, and so I, I just had to take artistic <laughs> license and do what was best for the story. <laughs> just have her fly, save some time. I could do that, could do that. <laughs> that would be a different genre, a, but... <laughs> yeah. You can't have a biplane in every story, Jason. <sighs> the story seems to be structured, I was kind of thinking as I was going through the story, that it seems to be structured as, as a coming of age, as you mentioned. Um, with the main character, Edith, also having a, a special uh, ability, which is, or you could call it a disability, um, the synesthesia. Yeah. Um, and she's kind of dealing with that. That's like a main core part of the story. Uh, so I was starting to think of Edith as a kind of a superhero um, in like a superhero narrative. Uh, do, you, do you think that fits at all? Or, or what are your thoughts on that? I think it does and it doesn't in the sense that you know, the best superheroes are your everyday normal people who discover that there's something unique about them, right? So they don't just emerge, you know, fully formed and, and able to do these things. They, they discover these things about themselves, right? And so I think that's true about everybody. I think, you know, the, the best superhero stories too are centered around the hero's journey, you know? And the reason the hero's journey type of story resonates with, with all of us is that we are each on a hero's journey. 
And we we're all in that kind of situation where we need to discover the thing about ourselves that enables us to slay the dragon or to, you know, conquer the, you know, conquer the challenge or climb the mountain or, you know, go into the underworld and emerge from the other side, you know, stronger, more resilient. And so I think that that's, yeah, in, in the sense that we are all on a superhero journey or a hero's journey. Yeah, Edith is one of those too. Is that kind of aspirational kind of idea? Do you think that's part of what may, what would make it young adult or is that something do you feel like that you're just bringing to it and it that would be a similar thing in something that wasn't necessarily a young adult book hmm I guess when you're when you're at that age when you're coming of age you're not quite jaded yet you're not so yeah you know disillusioned by life and so you might still believe in things like magic maybe that's why some of these more you know uh, my my book sort of bridges the fantasy historical genre it's not a it's not purely fantasy it's not purely history it has a crossover that way and i i think that so many young adult books play with the idea of magic or of fantasy because the readers are still they still want to hold on to that kind of childhood belief that you know anything could happen and even magic could happen right mm -hmm. there's a particular part in the in the novel that really jumped out at me as being it's not the climax of, of the novel, but it's 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 very, very core. And it's it's when Edith is sort of called. I don't think this is a spoiler. OK, it's just that she's kind of uh, she's kind of called she she's in a moment of crisis and she's kind of called to sort of help. And I and I think that you've already sort of been talking about this, but it seems to be partly because of her special ability. Mm -hmm. um, but it also seems to be bound up with her with her coming of age story. I think that there's, you know, for each one of us, there's going to be a moment where we come to that crossroads and we we recognize that there's something in us that holds the key or holds the answer to a particular situation. And it doesn't have to be a saving the world type of thing, right? I mean, we read these stories that are kind of larger than life, but we need to see that larger than life situation play out. We need to see that somebody average can solve that, you know? so that we know in our mundane, you know, our quotidian lives that we can uh, we, we can find that within ourselves. You know, we're equipped, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we have a choice to use that or not. We have a choice right. whether to use that, like, let's say, superpower or that ability that we have. Or we could just walk away, you know, out of fear or out of uh, self-doubt, any of those things. And so... That is, you know, Edith's choice is where is she going to, you know, get over herself enough? Is she is she going to put down her own insecurities and her own self-doubt and trust this ability that she has? Or is she going to let fear control her? And there's another, you know, as you know, there's another character in the book who makes a little bit of a different choice, you know, who, when that's presented mm -hmm. to them. And um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. The thing that I was trying to reconcile is that her ability is is definitely unique to her in, in a sense that um, not everybody has that particular particular ability. So what what you're sort of saying is um, take what you're given. You know, it's a normal thing that you're given different things and and sort of use them um, yeah, to make I... things better, to make the world better, to help people. Yeah, and I think, you know, Edith struggles with feeling like she's the only one who has this, you know, this particular way of way of seeing or way of being, but she discovers that she's not alone in that. And I, I think that's so important to, you know, especially, you know, teens often feel like they are the only ones who are struggling the way they are or who feel as bad as they do or, you know, and so to know that there, there are others like you out there or maybe even closer to, not just out there, but closer than you think. It's really so important to know that you're not alone. There's a lot of art also going on in your uh, in your book because you are an illustrator. So you, right. this is a fully illustrated novel as yeah. well. Do you want to mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that? And I want to ask about the color blue as well. Oh, sure. Yeah, so I'm an illustrator first and foremost. I've always been, uh, it's all, all I've ever wanted to be. 
And so when I started writing novels, I, I mean, it was a no brainer to, to say, you know, I have to get my pictures in there somewhere. Not because I think that words are any less than pictures in any way, but um, some things need to be painted in paint and some things need to be painted in words. And that's the fun part of it is deciding which is which for me. So, um, and, and also, you know, way back in the day with Dickens and authors like that, you, you often had their novels illustrated and that wasn't considered something for kids. That was just the way it was. It was, it was a storytelling device. And so I, I always kind of dreamed about bringing that back or being part of bringing that back with, you know, other authors who were doing that. So it's not a graphic novel. It's a, it's a fully illustrated, full color novel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And being that it's called a cloud of outrageous blue, um, the color blue must be, and, and I know it is important thematically. Yeah. Did you, did you want to talk a little bit about that? Because um, I suppose blue has been important in religion and throughout history. And of course, there's a big deal about blue in the novel. I, I don't know how much you want to go into detail. I don't want to do any spoilers, but um, let us let us know. Yeah, sure. So uh, if you've ever looked at medieval art, particularly in manuscripts and in iconography, the color blue is reserved for very special figures, especially the Virgin Mary. And that is because the actual pigment that was used was called lapis lazuli, or the stone was called lapis lazuli, and the pigment made of it was called ultramarine. And the only place you could get it at that time was Afghanistan. And so let that just open your mind for a minute, lest you think the medieval world was very small and dark. You know, the, the Silk Road was in full operation, and there was, you know, there was widespread trade you know, between continents, between Europe and Asia and Africa and the Middle East. And and so, um, but, you know, obviously that was a perilous journey. And so the, the lapis lazuli stone was worth its weight in gold, literally. And so if you see gold leaf in medieval art, well, lapis lazuli is just as precious. We don't think of it today like that. You know, it's you can go down to the local craft store and buy some lapis lazuli stones and make a necklace out of it. You know, it's not that expensive, but but also, you know, the process to get the pigment out of that stone was really, really, it was a chemical process. It was like very, very costly and very time consuming. And so, you know, so Edith with her synesthesia, when she sees this color blue for the first time, it completely overwhelms her senses and she doesn't know you know, she's a peasant girl from a village where the brightest color she might see would be the blue of the blue sky, you know. Um, but when she encounters this really, really intense color, it's almost like it's from another world. It's It, it completely overwhelms her senses. And so, um, and I won't say any more about that because that would be a spoiler. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's just well, say it's very important. <laughs> I don't want a spoiler, but Miss Elizabeth uh, mentioned earlier about biplanes. Now, I've read a lot of books in my lifetime, and I find all the best ones either have a biplane fight, like a dog fight in it, or characters <laughs> fighting on the wing of a biplane. So without giving any spoilers, I, even a yes, no question or yeah, answer would be sufficient. Are there biplanes in this book? No. <laughs> oh, well, that's all right. Yeah, you, you, you know, you're not done writing. You got to, if you're planning to write a new book, just consider that a, a helpful tip. Well, I'll helpful certainly tip. take that under advisement. I'll, I'll certainly awesome. think about it. Awesome. Well, that's just free advice from me. You do have another book then that's in the making. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I do. So my first book, What the Night Sings, was about the post-Holocaust period. It's about two teenage Holocaust survivors who meet on the day that they're liberated from a concentration camp and how they go on to rebuild after that, you know, when everything and everyone has been taken from them. Another coming of age story, you know, figuring out how to do this adult thing when they've got, you know, no resources, you know. And so this next book that I'm writing is actually a spin-off of that. It's It starts with a secondary character and it tells the story of the Berlin Wall going up in 1961. And so I'm, I'm staying with the German history. I think it's really instructive for our own times, not just, you know, we have a lot of books about 
about the Holocaust um, from different perspectives. And mine is a, a little bit of a different perspective in that, you know, it takes place um, right at the end of that. But we don't often hear a lot about what happened in Germany in the immediate years after that with the, you know, how Germany um, became two countries after that and the the rebuilding after the war and, um, you know, how, where did all of the former perpetrators go? You know, did they blend back into society? Did, you know, and so I'm attempting to tell that story through the lens of one family. Well, that sounds, that sounds really, really interesting. No biplanes, but it's probably pretty good anyway. There could be biplanes. Oh, yeah, it could be, be, could be. Who knows? You know, I'll try to sneak a biplane in there just for you. We'll we'll see if that works out. (laughs) <laughs> um, where can people follow you? I mean, we're online, uh, we're in an epidemic, and we're all doing this meeting online anyway. So is there is there anywhere where pe- people can sort of join with you? Um, do you have like places where you prefer to meet with your, your fans and, and people that you can kind of uh, talk to about your work, but also talk to them about their work or support them? Yeah, so um, the the advantage to this pandemic time is that everything is online, which means that if I was going to be in another city or if I was here in Smileton, you know, previously people couldn't join that unless you were in Smileton. But now with everything being online, anybody from all over the world can come and hang out with me at my author events. And I'm doing quite a few of them. I'm doing about one a week right now, if not more. And so if you sign up for my newsletter at vesperillustration.com, that's a great place to kind of stay abreast of things. And uh, my Instagram, I always put up, you know, notices about my events and about things happening with the book and everything. But you can also join my locals community. So I have a podcast called Vesperisms where I talk about thinking like an artist and looking at the world through the worldview of an artist as opposed to the political worldview, which is, you know, as we all know, infecting everybody. And so if you come to vesperisms.locals.com, we we hang out there, we discuss the themes on the podcast, we do a lot of artistic stuff there. Um, so that would be a great place to hang out. And where should people be finding your book? What do you, is there a place you prefer people to find them? And can people get it signed? Well, You can buy the book wherever you love to buy books. So any of the big online retailers will carry it. But I really, uh, I really encourage people to support their local bookstores. So by hook or by book, you know, should have about (laughs) 10,000 copies all all signed (laughs) now. And if if that's your local bookstore, you should you should do that if you live in Smileton. But um, any of your local bookstores in your town would really, really love to have your business. And so uh, whether they have it on the shelves or they have to order it, buy it through them and they'll they'll be really happy. And if you want to get it signed, obviously I'm not doing physical signings right now, but you can get a free signed book plate uh, if you send your proof of purchase to info at vesperillustration.com. Well, Vesper, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us here on the Smile Syndicate Music Hour to tell your side of the story of what <laughs> happened with the ePogo stick and the book signing. Uh, I'm pretty sure that we all believe your side of the story, I think, more so than than Jason's side. I mean, Jason, Um, I did tell you on your left, didn't I? Yes. But but then you moved to the left. I got confused. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Vesper, I'd love it if you could stay for the rest of the show. Sure. uh, While we're just going to finish out the show. And um, maybe you can help us to introduce the song or something like that. Oh, my goodness. Does that sound good? That would be a a, a pleasure. I would love that. Sounds good. Oh, and did you win? Did you win the contest? I mean, what do you think? You know, oh, see, see, I told you, <laughs> big city author, right in circles around the rubes. Only the best in Smile Syndicate. Yes, I, I know, I know. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching this Smile Syndicate video. If you liked it and you want more, come on over to locals.com and you can check it out for free with a promo code. See you over there. <laughs> <laughs>